What's up, lovely people? This is Medicosis Perfectionist, where medicine makes perfect sense. We continue our playlist called 5-Minute Review. It's time to talk about cerebral palsy. Never forget, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is video number two in this playlist. The previous one was nephrotic syndrome, where you have high protein in your urea, low protein in your emia, edema, and hyperlipidemia. Cerebral palsy, what's cracking racking? It's an injury to the developing brain. And as you know, neurons do not regenerate. I'm talking about the cell body or the soma of the neuron. Once it's gone, it's gone, especially if your brain is still developing and growing. An injury here is most probably irreversible. This will lead to an encephalopathy. What does that mean? Pathy means pathology. Encephalo is the brain. It's a pathology in your brain, a disease in your brain. This can cause static problems. What does that mean? Non-progressive. It doesn't get worse. Contrast that with something like creutzfeldt jakob disease that was a very rapidly progressive dementia with myoclonus. It gets worse real quick. You can go from a patent lawyer to someone who does not remember his own name in a matter of months. It's a horrible disease. Cerebral palsy, however, does not get worse. Most of the time, motor symptoms, such as paralysis. Can I have sensory symptoms? Yes, sensory and the special senses as well. How about the IQ? It could be low, it could be normal, it depends. Risk factors are many. The most important two risk factors are low birth weight and preterm birth. Cerebral palsy is a clinical diagnosis. Does that mean that I should not order an MRI? You can do whatever you want, but MRI is not what diagnose cerebral palsy. You are the one who has to call the shots. That's why you need to study. Cerebral palsy has two main subtypes, spastic and athetoid. If it's spastic, the problem is usually in my pyramidal tract. If it's athetoid, it's usually the extra pyramidal tract. Let's review some neuroanatomy. What was the function of the pyramidal tract and what was the function of the extra pyramidal tract? The pyramidal tract is responsible for movement of isolated muscles. Let's say my right brachioradialis. The extra pyramidal tract is responsible for synergistic movements. Example, let's say I'm playing tennis and I want to swing my right arm. This is not just one muscle movement. This is many muscles, including the biceps, the brachioradialis, the rotator cuff muscles, and many, many more. So for, in order for this to be coordinated, in one smooth strike, you need your extra pyramidal tract. What will I get if I injure my pyramidal tract? Well, problems with movement. If I am unable to move both of my legs, this is called paraplegia or diplegia. If I can't move my right arm and my right leg, both are on the same side, this is called hemiplegia. If I can't move my four limbs, this is quadriplegia. All of them are spastic. Why? Because this is in your brain. This is an upper motor neuron lesion. And when you injure your upper motor neuron, you get spastic paralysis or paresis. On the other hand, here you get athetoid movement. Remember, athetosis is similar to chorea-like movements because the basal ganglia, believe it or not, is part of the extrapyramidal tract, not the pyramidal tract. So it makes sense that these symptoms look like Huntington's disease. Risk factors are many. We have maternal risk factors, prenatal risk factors, perinatal and postnatal. Maternal, preterm labor, multiple gestations. If mommy is pregnant with twins or triplets, extra embryos are competing on a limited number of resources, leading to a low body weight. Prenatal risk factors, intrauterine growth retardation, torch infections, and congenital anomalies. Perinatal, well, you should be born around 39 or the 40th week. Less than that is bad, more than that is also bad. Low APGAR score is not fun and precipitous delivery. It's like a country song where everything that can go wrong will. Postnatal trauma, carnicterous, intraventricular hemorrhage, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Clinically speaking, static non-progressive encephalopathies. Static, mostly motor problems, you can get sensory. There is microcephaly and athetosis. The diagnosis is clinical. Repeated physical exam. Dear parent, please bring the child to me today and then next month, and then the following month, and then the month after, every time there is hypertonia, hyperreflexia, asymmetric reflexes, they are not going away. 
the baby is not growing up like his peers, that's your diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Management, unfortunately, there is not much we can do so far. Adaptive skills, special education, physical therapy. Differential diagnosis of athetosis, remember, is a basal ganglion lesion. So stroke, cerebral palsy, cerebral anoxia, Wilson disease. Pause and review. Let's review cerebral palsy from Picmonic. Risk factors include maternal infections, fetal hypoxia, the hippo oxygen. Symptoms include developmental delay, neurological dysfunction, spasticity, and dysphagia. Management can include muscle relaxant, muscle exercises, braces, and assistive devices. If you like this video, I have a whole course about CNS pharmacology on my website medicosisperfectionist.com. Learn about opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, sedatives, hypnotics, anti-epileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-Parkinson's medications. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thanks for watching. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.